Good day everyone. Scooter coming to you live from the Granville Guitars World Headquarters here in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida. Today is October the 28th, 2019. And I have on my bench what I'm fairly certain was a mid to late 60s Fender Twin Reverb um, that has been uh, rather primitively restored we're going to call and uh, I'm, I'm going to have to do quite a bit of uh, restorative work to this I'm going to have to restore the restoration as it as it were um, there's a lot to show here and I just want to kind of go through a little bit of this uh, there are a whole ton of really bad solder joints in right here and I'm going to try and zoom in on this so you can see this. Um, hopefully this bad boy is going to cooperate here. My tripod is uh, less than state of the art, but we'll see. You can see this solder joint right here. There are just a ton of these like this in this amp. This wire here doesn't even look like it ever took the solder. Uh, the joint is very cakey and clumpy and malformed. Uh, that means that the, the work, meaning the components and the wire and the eyelet, were not hot enough to accept the solder. This is a lesson right here about soldering. Okay, Soldering is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It requires a decent tool and it requires some patience and care and you want to be as clean with your work as possible so being uh, a bit of a neat freak does uh, kind of count in situations like this when you are performing a solder joint first of all everything needs to be clean okay I am not a big some people will tell you that when you're replacing a component like this one for instance like this 100k resistor here some people will tell you that what you can do is to simply heat up that solder and pull the component out, heat up the solder again and shove the new component in. That is no way to make a decent professional grade solder joint. That procedure is wrong. Every time this joint needs something done to it, something replaced, anything, all components come out, all old solder comes out, period. That's the way I do it in my shop. That's the way most professional shops do it. There is no reason or need, solder is not that expensive. There is no need or reason to keep the old solder. If you are replacing a component, replace the solder. This way you are assured to have a good quality professional solder joint and your amp is gonna sound cleaner and it's going to sound that way longer. Okay, so the proper procedure is everything comes out of this hole, it gets cleaned up. Uh, I like to use naphtha, otherwise known as lighter fluid, to clean most of this kind of thing. Whoops, went the wrong way. <laughs> um, make sure it's all cleaned up really good, scrape off any, uh, any flux that won't come off with, with liquid means and get it all cleaned up and what you do is pretend this is the soldering iron okay we're gonna to touch the soldering iron and pretend there's no solder here you touch the soldering iron to the work and you are gonna heat the work not the solder okay then you're gonna come in with the solder let's pretend that this orange wire is the solder okay then you're gonna come in with the solder and you're gonna to touch the work with the solder not the iron the, so the, the, the solder goes onto the work and if it won't flow onto the work the work is not hot enough yet okay that's why a professional grade iron is very important for professional grade results it's not vital but it's certainly easier I use 725 degrees for almost everything uh, I use a Weller variable control with a digital readout that's set to 725 and it's pretty much on all the time and that's pretty much where I leave it set so again soldering iron touch it to the work 
okay, with, with nothing on this eyelet, right? Then once the work is hot, you touch the solder, pretending this orange wire is the solder, you touch the solder to the work, not the iron, all right? End of lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I it just I see so many bad solder joints from previous technicians or amateurs who were learning, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. No one does perfect solder joints right out of the bucket. Okay, you you, you have to work at it. But as you can see, as we move across here, someone's redone the input jacks too, and I'm going to have to redo all that because, as you can see, more clumpy, junky looking solder joints there. Now this particular amp this uh, mid to late 60s twin I think it's a 67 or was at some point in its life all the original iron is gone um, there are some original pots but uh, most of them can't be read uh, at least easily anyway so uh, once again I'm, I'm gonna zoom in in this next section here and and you know uh, we can see right there behind this this large cap this is one of the problems with the amp right here uh, this is one of your uh, reverb driver cathode resistor uh, and, uh, and, and cap. Actually, that's not. That's the, uh, that's the second preamp cathode and resistor right there. Okay. You can see the end of this is blown out. And this is not that old a cap. Uh, the person that did all of this work installed all of these Sprague Black Beauties. But you can see that this 2.2K resistor here next to it is cracked in half and you know you can't even read the value anymore so that uh, that failure there led to this cap exploding this this has got to be replaced in order for this to sound right but you know again here if we if we look right down here there's more really funky solder joints and they're all over the place in this amp I the, the number of solder joints I'm not gonna redo is a much smaller number than the ones that I am and they're from one end to the other now this person who did this uh, I don't think is a professional I don't know that for a fact I think they were they did this several years ago and were just trying to tackle it in a D, in the DIY spirit uh, spirit rather and I, I'm okay with that that's you know that's how this kind of thing gets started that's how you get into this sort of stuff but uh, he's been having problems with it. The reverb and tremolo have been intermittent, and there's no, there's no uh, need to wonder why with that blown out cap and, and toasty resistor. Um, there's a couple other things up over here. If we look, uh, I believe that's the original uh, bias supply uh, potentiometer. Let me get around here where I can get a better angle. Hopefully, you can see that. Uh, it has a manufacturing code of 1967 on it, but here is a really good example of what not to do. This is not a good solder joint. The material was not hot enough to accept the solder, so it didn't melt all the way. That's why it's called a cold solder joint, because the, the material was not hot enough to accept the, the solder. Will it hold it in place? Yeah. And it'll probably work, sometimes for a long time. But eventually it will fail before it should have failed. And to be honest, it, just, it doesn't suit me. <laughs> so that's going to get redone. Um, and he says that he had to change this value to get the bias range correct, which shouldn't be on a twin. So there may be something else I have to investigate there. We'll, we'll investigate that further as we go on. Now here's the bias supply, and if I can possibly get a little more light, uh, the uh, rectifier diodes. Now, it really doesn't hurt anything to install them up high like this, but I don't like to have them up that, that high. Um, I just feel like you're asking for it. They need to be down against the board, or at least closer to the board. So I'm going to redo all of that. Um, he used a, a, a good quality, I think, uh, cap here. This looks like it might be a Nichicon. It is. It's a 47 at 100 volts, which is probably okay. Uh, Nichicon is definitely a good brand. I'm going to increase that size. I like to use 100 at 100, particularly with a twin reverb. 
Now, you'll notice this resistor up here, this 470 ohm resistor that's part of your bias supply. I had a bad experience with those guys. That is actually a molded uh, carbon comp resistor. And you can tell it because it's got, let me get up over top of it a little bit. Um, maybe you can see it better here. All right. You see this seam right here, that little line that goes across here? Okay. That's how that was molded. It was molded into a mold that had two halves, top and bottom as opposed to one that was poured in from the sides, okay? These molded resistors fail prematurely. And I found this out the hard way. Uh, a number of years back, um, I redid a, uh, a 66 fender basement, and you can see the videos on it if you go and look at my YouTube channel for my other videos um, of the work that I did on that amplifier. Uh, I sold it for a few years and it came back to me and when it came back it sounded absolutely terrible. It, it was the worst sounding amp I'd ever heard in my life so I cracked it open and almost every one of these resistors was crumbling apart. It had been in constant use since it was away from me. Matter of fact it was being used for bass guitar. Uh, there's another one over here in uh, the phase inverter, uh, the cathode resistor for the phase inverter which is this guy right here, this 470 ohm resistor. That's another one. That has to go bye-bye. Uh, when you see them with a line like that, these here are the poured ones. They're poured in from one end or the other. And these aren't as bad. These, these should be just fine. But these molded ones, I've personally had very bad experience with those. So I'm going to pull that out of there. Um, Matter of fact, these one megs are probably going to come out as well. Um, we're going to go with more blackface traditional values there. Or wait a minute, no, nope, those were over here. Now the ones I'm thinking of are, are right here. Those those are the correct blackface one megs and and and, and uh, the 470 in the middle, and then we have the 82k and the 100k here. But again, this one likely original, and this one's been replaced. Why wouldn't you just replace them both? You know, those uh, being your phase inverter plate resistors, I don't know why you wouldn't replace them both. Now, we can cry all we want to about the blue sausages being gone. The orange drops are here. They're good quality caps. I'm going to leave them alone. Um, and you can see the inputs there on the, uh, the effects channel, reverb and tremolo, have been uh, replaced and the soldering is less than ideal so that's going to be redone as well. Um, let's flip this thing over and look in a doghouse. Okay, uh, here's the doghouse with the uh, with the electrolytics in place and F and T's were used, those are my preference. Uh, metal oxide resistors here and also up in here for the totem pole. All the components are what I would use. However, if we look in here closely, you can see a couple of prime examples of what I'm talking about in terms of, um, well, frankly, lousy soldering. Uh, this looks like a big chunk, and it, it shouldn't look like a big chunk. Uh, this is not taken. Another cold solder joint. The thing is just littered with cold solder joints. So what I'm going to have to do to correct all of this is I'm going to have to heat this up, Remove all the components while the solder is hot. I like to do that. That way you're less likely to damage your work. Okay, so you get the solder hot and you pull everything out. Components first, resistors and caps, and then wires second. And then you get everything out of it except the solder. And then you have to come in and remove all of the old solder. Get that all cleaned up. Reinsert everything and reflow brand new clean solder in there. Um, that's the, the there's a right way and a wrong way to do this and the way that this is done presently is the wrong way will it work yeah it'll work but if, if a later if, if a later or a different technician should come along and see this they won't know where to start if there's an if there's a problem with the amp they'll they'll be saying to themselves well god where do I start there's so many bad solder joints Solder joints are notoriously hard to track down when you've got a bad one. 
So if you make them all good and all solid and you test them all out with a voltometer, you know, wiggle things around and make sure they're solid, you know, all of these are nasty under there too. You know, in some cases there's not been enough solder applied, in other cases they just didn't get it hot enough to accept the solder. Um, for those of you that are curious, all of the transformers in this thing have been replaced. Let's take a quick peek up here. Uh, you'll see the the uh, reverb uh, transformer is right there. It's a brand new replacement. Okay. Output transformer is here. Uh, that is also a new replacement. That's a classic tone, which is a very fine output transformer. And then we have uh, a genuine fender choke right here. And we have uh, a power transformer. I believe it's a 71. Uh, looking at the I'm sorry, looking at the code on it, it's the correct power transformer for a twin. Um, and I think it's a 71. It's, it's definitely not a 61. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a 71. Uh, that would be this right here. Um, anyway, it's got the CSA tested on it, which is Canadian Safety Administration, I believe is what that says. So it may have come out of a, an export amp or a universal amp or something of that nature. Um, let's have a look at the power tube sockets. All right, before I show you the, uh, the power tube sockets, uh, this is the area that I was dwelling on earlier uh, about proper solder technique as shown from the opposite side. Um, and that's the junction of the normal channel slope resistor and the normal channel uh, preamp plate resistor of this first one that junction right there you can just see how it's it just never got hot enough the work was never hot enough to accept the solder so yeah uh, and if we go down to oh boy let's go down here to well there's the blasted out uh, reverb section there that's got to get uh, worked on that's this cap and, and this resistor those will get replaced and then down here next to it, this is for the tremolo channel here. And just look at all of this. I mean, <laughs> it's a good old college try. And like I said, in the interest of full disclosure, this amp does fire up. And it does make sound. And it does sound pretty decent. Um, but the owner wants it to be something he's never going to have to worry about. He feels bad about uh, the work that was done initially. And he just wants it cleaned up, essentially, and made uh, a little more to the standards that I typically do things in my shop. There's another really nasty one right there. I seriously doubt whether this resistor is, is soldered in there well at all. And it, it looks like it's kind of barbecued. That one may be going away. Um, although that one is that 100 ohm resistor. Yeah, I've, I've got some of those I'm going to. I'm probably going to replace that. When I see them charred up like that one, um, man, things are probably going to get swapped out. And uh, the power tube sockets are <laughs> uh, pretty horrifying as well. Let's go down here. Um, now you can see, you know, he, he used good screen grid resistors. Uh, these these are acceptable, although they're not what I would use. I would use the five watt salt licks for this, but um, this is just some really crusty work in here, and it's it's a, it's going to fail prematurely. That's that's the that's the real reason to do this stuff right is premature failure. Um, you know, and you you can see a host of uh, crusty solder joints that just are going to have to be redone. Um, yeah, you can see where there's original solder joints in this thing occasionally. Um, now that I'm looking at those power switches, those look kind of scary too. Those are some lesser quality power switches. I may replace those, um, just to be on the safer side. Um, new production switches are quite a bit more safe than, than those. Those are kind of cheap. But, uh, you know, the other thing, too, is that it's got an awful lot of the original wire in it, which does lend a tone to an amplifier, this, this uh, solid core wire. However, 
it is prone to shorts particularly when you see how crusty it is this amp was clearly not stored well for a long time and when the wire starts to look like that let's see if I can get my pointer in here like this wire right here when it starts to look I mean this this wire originally was either white or yellow and it's some kind of dark brownish something now so yeah all of this work is gonna have to get redone um, just because you know like I said my marching orders are to uh, make this thing suit me and as it sits right now it doesn't so um, I fear I'm gonna be going fairly deep into this <laughs> anyway if this sort of thing interests you uh, seeing the before and the after and uh, it's, you know it's not boring for you then stay tuned and I will show you the after stuff again you know some people look inside these amps and see all those orange drops and they cringe well you know what the uh, original caps are gone should they have been pulled uh, probably not all of them uh, were bad um, some of them probably were um, I like to leave them in until they're just plain uh, uh, you just can't tolerate them anymore they're just too much noise or leakage um, but what we have is we have orange drops and these these are good quality capacitors they they'll sound good and give years of service when they're when they're installed properly so this is my uh, this is my task with this amplifier is to clean up all this wiring so stay tuned and we'll uh, we'll show you what happens as it goes all right I'm still working on the uh, filter supply board on this twin and as you can see, I've, uh, I've completed some of it already. Uh, this joint right here was the one that was really bad. It was all clumped up. It was piled up to about here. I've replaced this one wire that actually runs back over to the board on the other side. And this one I've uh, stripped back slightly. And uh, I had removed everything from here and re redid it all. What I'm going to do now is something I don't typically do. I'm going to show you how I do this. Close up and in person. These are two of the really the, the worst solder joints on here. So I'm going to back up maybe just a little bit there. And I'm just going to do what I do here. And I'll chat with you while I'm doing it. Okay, I've done this joint here already. I'm going to first heat this solder joint right here. Once it gets pliable, we'll start pulling up the components to spare them the heat. Okay, so we've got the joint all by itself. And uh, while it's hot, then I'm going to heat it back up again, get it molten. I'm going to come in here with the Weller solder sucker, and I don't, uh, um, I use a solder sucker and wick. I know some guys prefer one or the other. I find that I need to use both. The solder sucker gets the majority of it, and then the wick is going to come back in here and clean that. Now you're going to see an excess of old flux around that. I like to take a screwdriver and very carefully kind of scrape the worst of it away. Okay, I'm going to come in here with some naphtha or lighter fluid if you prefer to call it that. And I'm going to clean this up a bit so that we have a nice clean eyelet to solder to. Now, I'm going to examine what I've got to solder here. That's about the right length. Uh, that's the lead on the capacitor. But it's got a little bit of extra solder on it that I don't want. So I'm going to run some, run the wick against it. Heat that up and get a little bit of that off there. You don't need to get a lot of it off. This resistor as well. You want to get some of it off of there. 
you only want as much solder as you need. Okay, this one's got some excess on it as well. Get some of that off. All right. Now I'm going to center this up again here and come in a little further so you can see what I'm doing here. Hopefully this is hopefully this is well lit enough for you to get an idea. Okay, put this wire in here. Resistor next to it. That's a 1K. This capacitor in there. Generally, I will straighten these leads out a little bit, but since they've already been soldered in at least twice, I don't want to bend them around too much and, and risk breaking the connection to the actual body of the capacitor. Okay, I may... Whoops. I may have to... Uh, nope, it's going to fit. Sometimes you have to remove some more of that solder, particularly if you've got four leads going in there. You can see the other end of this one's gonna gonna take a little bit of work as well. Okay, so now here's where soldering technique comes in. Okay, I'm gonna put a tiny bit of solder on the iron itself and then give a little bit of a wipe on the sponge. That's tinning the solder. Now I'm going to hold it on the work, meaning all the components in the eyelet. Eventually you'll see the solder will start to melt against that eyelet. Okay, now once i got a nice big area of solder, I'll come up here to the top of that cap and then hold it in place. And that helps the solder to come up onto the component. I like to remove the soldering iron from the eyelet first and come onto the component and up because then the cooling starts first on the eyelet itself and the solder tends to stick better to the component at least that's my experience okay again this is more lighter fluid and we're just going to clean this area of any flux residue that we want to get rid of now Let's zoom in there and look at that thing. Whoops. It's not going to let me zoom in that far. Nope, sorry. This thing is kind of particular sometimes. There, it's clearing up a little bit. So that's what we want. We want a nice, shiny solder joint with a good, uh, smooth, silvery appearance to it. Okay, now let's move over to the other side of this resistor right there that's a particularly bad joint so once again we're going to hit it with some heat get the iron on there get the components out first so that we have minimal heat damage to to the components Boy, there's a lot of solder in this one get that wire up out of the way that resistor has got a whole bunch on it too. This is time consuming and messy as you can imagine. Um, with the majority of this amplifier requiring this to be done. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take about 10 to 15 hours total. And cost you know, several hundred dollars worth. Um, just for those of you here who are curious um, but it's got to be right it's got to you know it's got to suit me now we've actually there was so much solder that it actually made a little foot look at that I just pulled that out of there with a soldering iron on the underside I'm gonna heat it up again hit it with the solder sucker that gets the majority of it okay and again I'm gonna empty out my solder sucker and get the wick and the solder wick will uh... the importance of the solder wick is not just to get the last bit of solder out from underneath it really is so that you have as much room 
to put stuff in there as possible, particularly when you've got three and four components or wires, you know, like you do on the power supply of a twin reverb like this. You, you want that to allow you the, the maximum space to put things in. And again, we're going to clean this up. You want to clean things as much as you can. Flux is kind of can become a problem later on. Um, I'm going to stick this resistor in there first. And this resistor has been monkeyed around quite a bit uh, between the original install and what I've done to it. So I'm going to test this thing while it's sitting in there. 4.653K. It's exactly what we want. So it's fine. But it never hurts to measure. This lead for this cap might be a bit too long. Let's see here. Yeah, it's too long. It's a lot too long. So I'm going to pull it kind of snug there. And then I'm going to come in with my clippers and clip it off where I want it on the underside. Then, I'm going to use a probe and bend it back so that when I'm ready to put this wire in here, I have a nice little space and it should tuck in there and I tuck this wire in out of the way. I usually like to make these wires straight, or not wires, but these component leads straight, but again, it's I, when I'm redoing things like this, it, it, it really, I, I don't like leaving them all wiggly like that, but you don't, when, when a component's been soldered in at least once, and in the case of these, they've been soldered in twice, um, you don't want to risk breaking the component lead. Uh, let me go right back here. It's kind of a delicate little little weld right there and so you kind of have to be careful with it you want it down against the board nice and snug if you can um, anyway now that that solder joint is finished clean that up some more like I said if it looks good it is good it should be clean and shiny and tight everything should nothing should wiggle uh, out of place too much so that's what we have there. That's um, a real quick demonstration of what I do when I'm desoldering and resoldering. Um, it's like I said, it's a tedious process, but in the long run, you have an amplifier that's going to be reliable for a long time. And uh, I've already done the other side, the uh, mostly grounded negative side, except for this guy right here. I've already done the other side. So we're going to screw this thing back down and I'm going to flip it over and work on the main board. Alright, coming up on the end of this first day, the uh, filter supply stuff has all been resoldered, And I've just finished up here with the tone stack for the normal channel, bass, mid, treble caps. And uh, they're associated soldering right down there as you can see these are much cleaner and more solid uh, I took the screw out so I could make sure there was no debris under there turned out there were a family of cockroaches under there that are were not uh, they've since passed on and I I had to shuffle out their mortal remains uh, redid this joint this joint um, at this point I'm just kind of redoing every solder joint that had that was that's not factory in the amp, and uh, that really is most of them. So, uh, yeah. And then once I'm done with the board and the smaller um, uh, bias supply board and rectifier board, and all that sort of jazz, um, I'll proceed to the power tube sockets. And at that point, I'm going to listen to the amplifier and see what it sounds like. And uh, if I'm still not getting what I want out of it, I'm going to begin replacing the wires to the tube sockets. That's going to be my final uh, 
stage in this. Uh, it's going to be my last choice. Uh, I kind of want to leave those in, in position. So far they're testing out okay. I don't foresee having to replace those, but I will if I have to. So, yeah, this poor old girl was just, you know, abused through its entire life and it had had a bunch of mods done to it. Uh, and I've talked to the uh, owner of it since I made my last segment. Apparently, he was trying his best to undo all the modifications that had been made. And, uh, you know, so that was where he was going with uh, these attempts to uh, bring it back to stock. Um, it's just that his execution was lacking a little bit. So, this is ending up to kind of be a, a complete overhaul of the entire thing, really. Um, it's going to be fairly extensive, I think, before I'm finally finished with it. So we're, uh, we're finished with the board. Uh, I'm going to start right here in the morning. I've already done the other side of that uh, cap. Uh, but this, this is the next, next solder joint that's, that's up. So as you can see, I'm still pretty early <laughs> in the process. This is going to take a while. So stay tuned. All right, we're up to day two on uh, this assault on the twin reverb here. Um, here's the, the solder joint that I left off with yesterday right here. As you can see, I've moved on uh, towards the rest of the amplifier. Redid that ground there for, uh, oh, what is that stuff? That's the vibrato channel. Uh, first preamp cathode and resistor and also the normal channel first preamp uh, They're hiding down in there and this wire is kind of in my way. I'm just going to sweep it out of the way for now but, um, And we've redone all of this. This is the tone stack here for the uh, effects channel or as they call it the vibrato channel and uh, all of those have been redone and on this side of the board, let's see, yeah, I went all the way over to here. Now, this was the cap that was blown up. Um, or was it this one? <laughs> I don't remember. I just went ahead and it was this one. It was this one here with the 2.2K. Um, I went ahead and replaced that whole situation. Now, if you'll refer back to the video... I did replace this cap because the one that was in there was an inappropriate uh, component. It was actually a varistor, not a capacitor. So that had to come out and has been replaced with this STK that I like to use quite a bit. Shortened the leads on this uh, 500 Pico here. And this one meg, uh, that's the uh, reverb driver grid resistor. That was actually completely missing from the amplifier. So, <laughs> I installed uh, this Dale precision resistor right there. And this was redone. And this is not one of my joints. This is where I've... Uh, that's as far as I've come up to this point. Um, and I stopped right here. So, if we pan back, you can see that in essentially eight hours worth of work, I've done the filter supply board on the other side and I've gotten up to here uh, and I also replaced all of these hundred K's uh, right in here uh, the, the, the old ones that were still present were kind of scorched and that's definitely a source of noise in these amplifiers I like to use carbon films in those areas because they're reliable and they're quiet um, now as I was preparing to move on my vision started to wander over here to the uh, the first preamp tube socket, which was kind of making some racket uh, when I first powered the amp up. And uh, one of the reasons why may be these filament wires. The, uh, um, wait a minute, it was not V1, it was V2. Sorry, we're going to have to go over here. And some of this mess is going to have to get moved out of the way slightly. So you can see that this filament wire is not even soldered at all. There, there's nothing holding that thing in there. Um, 
I don't think, well, yeah, this is original filament wire. So that's, an attempt was made to redo this solder joint right there, or let's see, right here, and uh, failed miserably. <laughs> so, and you can also see some more clumpiness going on here and here. There is some replaced wire, but yeah, I, again, it, it's just going to be a big restoration project, almost what you know you might call a frame off restoration. <laughs> Because a whole bunch of this stuff's going to have to get redone and replaced. So anyway, um, I do have other tasks I've got to get to in the shop. I was kind of hoping for more progress on this, but I've come up to this point on the board right there. Uh, the next thing I tackle is going to be in this area here. and I'm going to set this thing aside for today, and uh, I'll get back after it tomorrow after I've uh, hit up a few other things. So stay tuned. All right, we're on day three of this twin reverb assault here. And uh, these are the jacks from the normal channel, which are going to get completely redone. What a mess. Um, there's a particularly bad couple of solder joints here. You know, and the problem here is that these jacks get monkeyed around during the life of an amplifier. You know, are connections being made? Yeah, they are, kind of. But eventually stuff like this is going to, you know, get intermittent and cause problems and all that sort of jazz. So I'm going to redo that. I've also come to the realization that a fair amount of this wire is going to have to go. And I've been replacing some of it. You can see this wire here. Um, uh, this is from the normal channel uh, plate resistors right there to over to pin one. I've already replaced it. Some of these are testing okay, and I'm probably going to leave a few of them, but a lot of them are going to get replaced. Um, I'm not sure where I left off yesterday. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, okay. This is the cathode arrangement here, bypass stuff. Uh, tone stack for normal, tone stack for vibrato channel. And you can see as I'm going through this thing, hopefully the work is is improved and will be more stable. Um, this was the cap here that had exploded. We saw it, this thing from the other side uh, in yesterday's clip. And then I came down here further. Um, this is the... Oh, what is that? That's the arrangement for the reverb recovery tube for the uh, the bypass the cathode stuff and then we have down there the uh, capacitor resistor network for the tremolo circuit and I've redone all of that the only thing I left here uh, actually I used it I, I replaced these one megs I really like these Dale resistors and I use them when I can uh, they're very reliable and uh, in a situation like this where it's modulating something uh, you want reliability this resistor was okay, so I left it in place, this uh, 2.2 meg. Uh, yeah, that's where it is, 2.2 meg. Uh, that resistor is your uh, is for the opto-isolator. Um, and I've actually stopped at that point there. And uh, went down to here at the bottom of this arrangement and that's that's as far up as I've gone now you can see if we lean in here a little bit that I've gone ahead and replaced a bunch of the wires for this uh, it just it was acting funny it sounded kinda drippy uh, when it was on and a lot of these solder joints were really really awful as well as the wire being questionable and you can see that's kinda where I've left off um, after yesterday so I've gotten a fair distance down the board uh, replacing and redoing and re-soldering and, and all that sort of jazz. Um, that's, that's about all for this particular little segment here. Um, like I said, I don't, uh, I don't remember exactly where I was yesterday. You get into something like this and pretty soon you're chasing yourself down a rabbit hole and you've got several different 
uh, things that you're doing all at once and wires flying all over the amp and uh, that kind of stuff so that's where I'm at right now we're up to and including the wiring for the uh, the tremolo and uh, work continues well I have decided to instigate or institute rather <laughs> a scorched earth policy here <laughs> It's just been one of these things where the more you unravel, the more ugliness appears. So, I've kind of just cast caution and, and otherwise uh, good sense to the wind. And I'm replacing all the wire in it as well. Uh, the filament wires are original. Those will remain. The sockets are original. But I've gone ahead and replaced all of the wire through here. You can see for the ins and outs of the two uh, first preamp tubes I've installed shielded cable uh, that's shielded at the other end uh, I've gone ahead and redone the input jacks here you can get a better view of uh, the rewiring on the input jacks uh, I've, I've replaced the uh, the resistors, these 268Ks and this 1 meg uh, at the input here. I've replaced those with the Dales that I prefer. One of the reasons I like those Dale Precision resistors, uh, they're mil spec, so they're very accurate, but they're also very quiet. Um, and that's important right there at the beginning of your signal chain because any noise that develops right there is going to be amplified as it moves through the amplifier so um, let's kind of bend this out of the way it sort of looks like it might be connected but it's not uh, anyway uh, there are your input jacks for that channel <coughs> uh, I did have to redo um, the wiring to the bright switch and one little jumper wire there uh, as we continue on over uh, I'm going to change camera angles again here. Again, you can see right up in here where I've redone all of this wire. Um, the one concession to vintage specs that I've made here is I have used the same style of wire, which is this solid core wire uh, that's cloth covered. Uh, it's easy to work with. It stays where you put it. And I think it contributes a certain tone to these amps. Um, it might be that it resonates sympathetically um, because it is just a single strand rather than um, you know a bunch of strands uh, twisted together. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's my imagination, but I went. Ahead, that's what I went ahead and used. Um, I've got my uh, preamp tube wiring all complete um, up to let's see V1, 2, 3 V4 is complete uh, V5 has not been done yet it's the point where I've left off here and uh, I'm still working on other areas of the board but I just reached a point where I, I said screw it <laughs> I was finding so much bad stuff and if you look down here you can see um, I've completely stripped uh, all of the the wiring for the the power tube sockets it's all gone every little bit of it um, got those grounds together for uh, the power tube sockets that go to pin 8 and uh, got everything nice and cleaned up and desoldered and uh, ready to accept new wires uh, that's the goal here so, um, there's the power cord. I may put a new power cord in it. Um, typically, when I redo these old amps, um, I eliminate the courtesy outlet and the polarity switch. Um, I, I just like to simplify things as much as possible. I leave them in place, but I do uh, remove the wiring. Now, if we come up here, you can see I've also... Uh, Desoldered all of the the uh, the phantom center tap stuff, uh, the the two 100 ohm resistors from uh, the pilot light, 
and I'm going to put new ones in there. And I've removed the board for the rectifier, diodes, and bias supply componentry. I already redid this ground right here, which is a uh, very important ground. It's a filter supply ground, and it was not very good. Uh, what I like to do here is I'll remove the these bolts, or these nuts rather, and this, and then I take a Dremel with a wire brush on it, and I scrub this clean, and then go back after it with some uh, naphtha or isopropyl alcohol, and just get it as clean as possible, and clean this up really good too, and then re-solder this connection. You, you absolutely want all your grounds to be solid. Now something else that's worth pointing out here, uh, if you look closely, you'll notice that there's not a hole here, it's a notch. This is not only not the original transformer, I'm thinking it might be an ultra-linear. Uh, it may be a very high-powered uh, power transformer. I haven't taken B-plus readings yet, so I don't know. So further component replacement may be necessary if this thing turns out to be, um, you know, one of those ultra-linears that's putting out a lot more B-plus than what this amp is used to. So file that under We Will See. <laughs> But uh, work continues. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the third day here. I was really hoping I could get sound out of this thing tomorrow. Um, we'll just have to see. Uh, you know, if, if I could devote my full time to this amp, um, it probably would have been done long before this. But uh, we have other repairs that I'm having to dive in and out of while I'm working on this and uh, it's necessary for me to um, take care of that stuff at the same time. Uh, I'm also going to replace the uh, power and standby switches. I think I mentioned that in an earlier video. And I also took the speaker jacks out um, and basically you know, cleared as much stuff out of the way so I can do uh, the wiring for these power tube sockets and phase inverter here. So. That is all for today, and um, I'm going to uh, tackle this thing in the morning. Stay tuned. All right, um, next morning, this is Thursday, it's actually Halloween, and uh, I've redone the, uh, the rectifier and bias supply board, and uh, this is all new componentry. I just decided it was, we're going scorched earth on this thing. I think I said that yesterday. Uh, I'm just going through it and, and redoing virtually everything now. Uh, I've got new uh, rectifier diodes. Everything's wired up in the back here, ready to accept the wires that need to get installed. And I cleaned the board up some so it looks nice. And it'll go back up in its position back up in there. Um, I think I had talked about that yesterday. The, maybe I didn't. Uh, I got the turret all cleaned up for the, uh, or bayonet rather, for the uh, pilot light. And I uh, got my ground positions all cleaned up here. Um, not much to tell since the last video clip. I just wanted to show that little uh, bias and rectifier board clean up close up and essentially we got it all stripped ready for new wire so let's dig in all right work continues got our rectifier right up in here this is our solid state rectifier this is the bias supply all brand new components clean that board up all new wiring um, we've got the uh, <clears throat> the bayonet for the uh, pilot light ready to go here. We've got our phantom center tap wired up, these 200 ohm resistors. And we've got our filament wires ready to go. I like to color code filament wires, particularly in a, in a four output tube arrangement, so that you can keep left to left and right to right very easily. Uh, when you wind them really tight, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to have those two colors there. So we're using black and yellow today. Um, let's see. I got the, uh, the bias supply, uh, potentiometer, desoldered and cleaned up. 
and uh, ready to accept its new wiring and new resistor. Um, we did a fair amount of removal and cleaning to this end of the board. I've already soldered the bug back in for the tremolo and replaced this resistor. This 10 meg I actually didn't have so I had to reuse the one that was there. Um, and then down here on the power tube sockets we have started work there. Uh, got the uh, the brown and red mains uh, for the high side there. That's pin 3 and then they're adjacent pin 3's. Boy that's dirty isn't it? Man. I still got a bunch of cleaning to do and wiring etc. And we've got our 1.5k swampers in there. Soldered on one end but not the other yet. Um, I started out with with those resistors and that wiring and then once you got to the point where those needed to be wired up I came up to here where they're supposed to get wired in uh, it's mm, it's gonna be uh, da -da 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 -da. let's see this one and this one are where they're gonna go um, and uh, you've probably already noticed if you if you're following along I like to put my wires uh, my wire runs uh, on the up on the outside where you can see them. A lot of wires on fender amps like this this one here, this blue wire and this one here would get tucked underneath. I don't like that for a lot of reasons. It makes it a lot harder to visually troubleshoot something. Um, I want to see the wires. I want to know where they're where everybody's going and you know I like to have things where I can see them. It makes a schematic much easier to follow too. You know, if, if you see a, a connection on a schematic, it's much easier if you can see it uh, inside the amplifier. So, uh, that's the last two hours worth of work there, and uh, I'm going to continue. Alright, here we are at what I was hoping would be the bitter end. <laughs> oh, it's bitter alright. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not finished. Um, we're all wired in up here once again rectifier and bias supply right there filament uh, supply hooked up to the bayonet for the lamp we got our filament wires we're all wired up power socket wise power tube socket wise that is um, bias pot down there uh, board is all wired up. New switches. New wire. Unfortunately, I opted to leave a bunch of the original filament wires in place. As you can see right there. Um, and I'm not getting any filament voltage to the first three tubes. That would be V1, which is the input tube for the normal channel. V2, which is the input tube for the vibrato channel, or effects channel if you will, and the uh, 12AT7 reverb driver. None of those are getting their uh, filament voltage, 6.3 volts of filament voltage, alternating current for that. Um, V4 is getting it, but kind of intermittently. Uh, V5 and 6 are, are getting it fine. So, I'm just going to pull all the filament wire. It's a uh, serious pain, because um, I hate wiring filaments. It's just no fun. Um, it's tedious. But, uh, we're not getting any voltage down here in the preamp, and it won't make any noise till I do. So, um, anyway, here's a close-up of the board. Uh, I got it all wired up. It's all nice and clean and neat. New wire, a lot of new components. Um, should sound pretty twin-like, I would, I would think. Um, left most of the wiring alone for the pots. Uh, the owner told me yesterday that those two pots for the tremolo circuit actually uh, were not there when he got the amp. He had to add them, and 
I touched up a little bit of the work there, but I'm expecting I'm going to have to do a little more work on that. I mainly wanted to hear something out of this now that I've been on it for the better part of four solid work days. I wanted to just hear the thing, for crying out loud. So, there's where we sit right now. I'm going to tackle these uh, filament wires. Alright, success! <laughs> she works, and she sounds spectacular, in spite of herself. <laughs> uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, let's see here. I did have to uh, change out the resistor for the bias supply. Uh, we started with the stock uh, 27K, and it was not giving us a usable range. So we ended up with a 15K in place, and the pot works fine, and that whole bias supply works real well too. Um, as I said at the end of the last segment, I had to redo the filaments all the way down to V1 down here. So that's exactly what I did, and uh, that cured that problem. Now I've got nice uh, filament voltage all the way down. I did replace, let's see if we can get a good shot of them here, uh, the power switch and the um, standby switch. Those are both brand new. Not the ones I typically use, and fitting them in there was kind of a pain. But uh, that's what I had in stock right now, and uh, they're, they're working just fine. Uh, nice big uh, carling switches. Um, let's see, we didn't talk anything about the, uh, the power tube sockets there. We got new screen grid resistors. I like to use 500 ohms, 5 watt, 1.5K swampers down there. The uh, the ground switch completely out of the circuit, and the courtesy outlet also completely out of the circuit. And you'll see that the black wire from the power cord goes directly to the fuse holder. Okay, and then there's the black wire from the power transformer on the other terminal for that, and then the white wire from. Let me see if I can. Well, it's been extended. The white wire actually goes to um, the uh, power switch along with the other half of the power transformer. The way I did that, which leads us over here, I usually prefer to use tag strips when possible. Um, main, uh, uh, instead of, you know, God forbid, wire nuts or, uh, you know, just twisting them together and, and heat shrinking, I, I prefer to do this. So I put a little terminal strip in there, and uh, what that terminal strip is doing, very simply, is uh, on the left there you'll see the black wire from the power transformer, which had been cut off very, very short. And uh, I've used this tag strip to terminate it there and extend that wire to its appropriate place over on the fuse holder. Uh, the white wire becomes yellow at that terminal and it goes on to the power switch. Um, these two wires here are grounded from the power transformer and that tab on the end there is my ground. You can see where I cleaned the chassis underneath it so I have a very hard ground and the tab next to it is also ground. I uh, wired that in ground. That way I have a nice easy access point for ground testing. Uh, you can see that I used bus wire down there to connect that one. The, uh, the There's a blank one in between them. Uh, should I have needed it, I might have used it, but I always like to leave a space between any connections and ground um, just for, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, that's the end of the work on this thing. Um, I powered it up. It sounds beautiful. Um, the speakers that are in it right now are very underpowered. I had a discussion with the owner about that. He's going to stick with them for now. Uh, but they're like a 30 watt uh, speaker out of a more modern Fender amp, two of them. And uh, they probably should get replaced if he's going to really give this amp a workout. But um, they do sound good. 
as long as you stay you know fairly conservative with your volume on this thing um, it works out pretty well anyway this uh, I'm calling this the the grave diggers amp because boy this thing was like rescuing an amp from the dead um, you know completely rewired um, but it's nice and quiet sounds really good uh, I was having a lot of fun with it the reverb is big and fat as you would expect um, I'm not gonna put a play demo at the end of this because I've taken some crap from people about having to forward through an hour's worth of me chatting about amplifier wiring before they hear a play demo so first thing tomorrow morning uh, being November the 1st of 2019 I'm going to do a separate uh, play demo to uh, show off what this thing sounds like anyway that's all I know for today and that's a lot <laughs> four days worth I know <laughs> if you have any questions about anything we do here at Granville Guitars seek us out on the web at www.granvilleguitars.com or you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram or the much disused blog over at WordPress, A View from the Granville Bench. And you can always email me at granville at tampabay.rr.com. Thanks for tuning in. Have a rockin' good day. <laughs>